And as we continue on in our series through Galatians, we come to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. And let's just do a quick recap on verses 11 to 13. When Cephas, that is Paul, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined with him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, if you remember, and if you were here last week, we saw how Peter, uh, Paul met with Peter and a bunch of the other disciples uh, in Jerusalem to get straight about what the gospel is. He wanted to confirm with them that he was preaching the same gospel as they were, that he wasn't going around preaching in vain. And they came to a conclusion. Yep, we share the same thing. Go on, keep doing the good work, Paul. Um, just remember to, 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 to take care of the poor as you do so. So nothing wrong with the gospel at all. But then when Paul later meets Peter in Antioch, that's in Greece, he finds that Peter has been now led astray, that Peter is clearly in the wrong. He has changed his practice to fit with the approval of others. And now he's compromising on the gospel. Peter was allowed these Judaizers, that is the people of the circumcision group, their false teachers that say things like, you must abstain from eating pork, you must be circumcised, you must do this, that and this, to be of Jewish appearance, to be of a Jewish Christianity. And if you don't do these things, then you're not saved and you're not part of God's family. And Paul has now shifted from a private discussion with Peter to now a public rebuke. David Livingston was a Scottish missionary in Africa. He was a slavery abolitionist, and he was a doctor. And there was, there's this story where a missionary organization went to contact him, and they said this, I quote, Have you found a good road... To go, uh, to go where you are. If so, we want to know so that we can send men to join you. Livingston wrote back, if you have men who will only come if they know where there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come when there's no road at all. Peter here is he's taking the easy road. He's faced opposition from the Judaizers and he's, he's capitulating. He's caved in. He's going with what is easy. He's saving face. And Paul says, if you keep doing this, then you're leading, going to start leading people astray to a false gospel. Okay, yeah, so we, we could be forgiven for thinking that these teachers, these apostles, people like Peter, were totally perfect in their, in their teaching, in their thoughts, in their theology. They never got anything wrong. And that's partly because most of what we know about them is found in their epistles, where they're speaking, carried along by the Holy Spirit, where they don't error, and they are inspired. But here we come to a point in Scripture where it's talking about a narration describing them, and Peter got it wrong. He was flawed. Even after Jesus had uh, risen from the dead, ascended to be with the Father, and they now have the Spirit, Peter was still deceived and got it wrong. And that should both encourage us and warn us it should encourage us because it should make us realize that God uses broken, fallible, imperfect people to do great things. But it should also warn us to not get a big head. To realize that the truth of the gospel is bigger than us and we need to cling to it. Otherwise, we'll fall away. We'll get deceived. And Peter fell for two reasons. 
The first reason he fall was, fell was because he didn't have clarity on what the gospel was and how works related to it. He seemed to be confused on this, so much so that he was led to a corrupted gospel. And secondly, he didn't have the backbone to stand up for what was right. Instead, gave in to peer pressure. So do you have clarity over what the gospel is? Even when I say that, do you know what I mean when I say the gospel? And do you know how that impacts your life? How you relate to that? How your works relate to that? You see, knowing the truth helps keep us from falling into error. And when we're not sure about what we believe, we're much more likely to be led astray. So hopefully, as we we go on tonight, you'll get more clarity on terms of what the gospel is. But just hold that thought for a moment. The second reason Peter went astray was because he lacked backbone. He lacked the courage to do what was right. We see in the scripture, it says that bad company corrupts good character. I want you to be careful who you let influence you. We let a lot of people influence us as we go through life. But often we let them influence us out of fear. Rather than us admiring them for their godly character. I went for a a walk with Josiah the other day. And it was very clear how much he admires his grandfather how much he loves his grandfather, how much he looks to his grandfather for guidance in life. He respects his wisdom and his godly character. There are people in your life that you need to stop listening to out of fear. And I'm sure there are also other people in your life you need to start listening to more because you admire their godly character. What's your motivation for letting people's voices impact what you do? Peter here has given in to the Judaizers out of fear when really he needed to be guided by his brother Paul. And we know, thankfully, that later in Acts 15, that, as we said last week, Peter does come round. It's, a, it's, it's got a good ending. He was restored to the truth of the gospel Spoken by Paul. Let's carry along in verse 14. When I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Peter was living in the freedom of the gospel before. He'd actually had a vision from God from Jesus himself, telling him that all foods were clean to eat now. So he should have known better that when people came in trying to impose extra rules and these kinds of things, that they were wrong to say those things. And yet he kept up appearances, making all the non-Jewish Christians keep these extra laws to be right with God. So Peter didn't just need to know the truth, Peter needed to have the conviction to live by it. And those are two different things. I want to ask you the question, do you expect people to live to a standard that you realise you can't keep yourself? That's what Peter was doing. He doesn't actually hold to these standards, only when certain people come. But now he's imposing on other people this burden that he doesn't even keep himself to. The Judaizers were were people that we would call legalists. Now, legalism is the belief that if you do certain things, you will earn favor with God. Often they mean salvation, eternal life. It's the opposite of the grace of the gospel. And you can actually condense all religions in the world into two camps. Legalism or grace. Grace. Legalism, by doing good, or in some understandings, more good than bad, 
you make yourself acceptable to God. And grace, the opposite, admits that you cannot do the good that God requires. But Jesus has done it for you. He has taken the consequence for your failure. And Jesus makes you acceptable before God. When you understand it like this, you realize how far the Judaizers had actually fallen from the truth. They'd reversed the gospel, they'd inverted it. And many people think that's how the Old Testament was. They, they read the Old Testament through that lens. And I really think that's a mistake. That's, that's looking to the Pharisees of Jesus' day and thinking they've got right theology of the Old Testament. They just don't understand how Jesus makes all things new. And that's, that's not the case. The scriptures say very clearly that the law, its purpose is to tell us what is right and what is wrong. It's never to tell us how to be justified before God, how to be saved, how to be right with him. And we even see in the scriptures, as we'll see later on in Galatians, that people were being saved by grace through their faith even before the law was given. But legalism by its nature is... Um, it's hypocritical. It's a system of religion that works by sinful human beings that can't keep their own rules, calling other people to keep the same rules that they can't keep themselves. And so to have any success in a legalistic system, you need to lower the standard that God sets and you need to lift your own uh, concept of your ability to keep it. It's just unrealistic. It's just not connected with any bearing on truth. And legalism is a weight that we can't carry. And we were never meant to carry. And so we should give it to the one that can carry it. Give performance to the one, as Jason said, that can carry it, Jesus. Don't do as Peter started doing and expect others to do what you know yourself cannot. Grace is as much for you as it is for others. Sometimes we as Christians need to remember that. That God's standard is perfection and you are not perfect and nor is your neighbour. But Christ is. And he has grace enough for you and anyone you encounter in your life. Verses 15 to 16. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Verse 15, I think Peter's using a bit of satire. We Jews, not those sinful Gentiles. I mean, Romans 3, verse 9 doesn't say that. It says Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin. I think Paul here is conceding, conceding a point for a moment by taking on the legalist Judaizer's opinion and getting to the real crux of it, which is against their beliefs entirely, know that the person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. That's the death nail in legalism. Works of the law, you're not going to be justified. We owe every part of our rightness with God to Jesus, and works get us nowhere when it comes to being justified before him. And I'm using this term justification, this is what the scriptures use, but what is it? How do you understand it? Well, typically it's a, it's a legal term. It is the pronouncement of innocence or the declaring of someone as morally right or good. Now, hopefully this analogy will help. It's limited, so don't take it too far, but I hope it will help. And that is the image of a good king that sits on a throne. And he has declared all the laws of the land. And they are good laws. They are righteous laws. 
And criminals that break those good laws are brought before him and judged innocent or guilty. We know from Scripture that the verdict of overall humanity is that against the king's standard, against God's standard, we come out guilty when we are judged by our works. So we stand before this righteous king, this good king, and are correctly judged as guilty. We are sentenced to death for crimes against our neighbours and for treason against the king. We, are, we have chains put, chains put on us and we have prisoners' clothes put over us. It's looking bleak. But in the gospel, there's a twist. And then that is that all of a sudden, the son of the king storms down the aisle, stands next to us, the guilty person, and he says, wait a moment. He says, king, father, what you've said is right. But let me offer a defense for this person. The prince The son of the king removes his royal garment and he takes the prisoner's clothes and chains and puts them on himself. He then puts his own royal garments on the guilty criminal. The king, with tears falling down his face, says, let it be so, for I will it so. And I knew you'd come, son. We, the guilty criminals, now become a member of the king's family. Our guilt is removed. Our debt is clear. And we are now presentable. We are seen as good, honorable, part of the king's family forever. We are pronounced as just, as right, as perfect, as acceptable, for we wear the prince's garment. And the prince, the son of the king, is led away to be executed in our place. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story. But how much did the criminal earn to have that happen? How much of a positive role did he play? He didn't do anything. In in fact, if we were going by what he earned, he earned the death sentence in the eyes of the good law. He did nothing. And could he return the favour in any way? Definitely not. It's impossible. And yet the gracious Father, and by the loving act of the Son, he has been justified, pronounced as just, good, wholly presentable. And that's what Jesus does. He not only takes our sin, but he gives us his rightness, his righteousness, his moral perfection. And that's something we often miss as Christians. We often talk so much about the fact that Jesus has taken our sin on the cross and we need him to do so. But we often forget the fact that if he just takes my sin, I'm not really changed at all. How could God love me, an unclean sinner? But no, he has clothed you in Jesus' perfection. So how does that impact our life? What difference does this make? Is this just some kind of theological thing we go, yep, tick, (laughs) that's good. No, it means we have peace with the Father. It means we can pray to God knowing that he has no wrath for us. He only has grace and love that we are now a child of his. And we were once not. He cares so much about you now. You're such an intimate relationship to the point where he says, cast all your anxieties onto me for I care for you. That's the relationship we now have with the Father. And as we go through life, we are now able to freely forgive others because we have been freely forgiven without any repayment called on our part. That's a radical impact. 
if you've been forgiven much, it's only natural that you forgive much. And being justified freely by nothing that we've done enables us to live lives in honour to God. Because our imperfect attempts, our poorly motivated attempts at serving God are now covered. We please him. We please God. Because we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. There's a freedom about that. Our acceptance is not to do with anything of our performance. Our acceptance is finalised and we can now live in family relationship with God. Verse 17 to 18. But if seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. For if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I would really be a lawbreaker. Paul here is saying, you know, Peter, you know, Barnabas, and the rest of you Jewish Christians, if eating unclean food is sin, and abstaining from them is part of our justification before God, wouldn't that mean you're also sinful Gentiles? Because weren't you eating with them before the Judaizers came? And aren't you, by the way, supposed to be Christ's representatives on earth? Is that calling into question now Christ? Oh, and didn't Christ also say himself, don't call anything impure that God has made clean? Checkmate. If what you are saying is true, Gentiles, and, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, if what you're saying is true, Peter, Barnabas, and the rest of the Jewish Christians, you're unclean. And worse than that, Christ promotes sin. So it's time that you rethink this arid, arid theology that you've stumbled into. So no way does Christ promote sin. But you want to know what sin would be? It would be to reinstate these food laws, circumcision, and other Jewish identity markers that Christ has fulfilled and put them as a barrier for entry into Christ's kingdom, into the family of God. That would be, that would be a sinful thing to do. To make certain works the ground of our justification, that's a sin. But I wonder what, if we ever do this to ourselves. It's, it's, it's very different when someone comes and says this. We're a lot better at reading other people's deception than the deception in our own thinking and our own thoughts. Are you, in your own internal dialogue, rebuilding what Christ has done away with? Do you ever find yourself casting guilt on yourself, saying, I'm a guilty sinner? That I'm not good enough for his grace. I'm not good enough to stand in his presence. Do you ever listen to the Judaizer that says, you don't belong? Or the legalist, you're not trying hard enough? Or Satan's lists of objections against you? You've erred here, you've erred here, you've erred here. You're so dirty. You don't deserve this. You know how you reply to those accusing voices, whether they be external, internal? Jesus said, do not call unclean that which I have made clean. Do not call unclean that which I have made clean. Because Christ has washed us with his perfection. He's removed your dirt. And if you reject that, then you're the unclean one. Judaizer, legalist, Satan. Because you stand in your grubby robe still. You're still standing with only your performance on display. But I've been washed, I've been cleaned, and I have the robes of the Son of God. That's the best way to argue against that kind of thinking. This doesn't put the performance on us looks to Christ, and even a misguided Peter, an apostle, looked at you and said, unclean, that's as much of an attack on Christ as it is on you. 
And when people start attacking Christ through us, we surely know we belong to him. Verse 19. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's saying, I gave up. I gave up trying to live and to keep this law in my own strength. Legalism has become dead to me. He came to the end of himself and realized he can't keep this thing if he's going to be judged based on his performance of it. And in dying to the law, in giving up trying to live perfectly without God, he cast himself onto Christ. He now realizes actually how truly sinful he is in light of the law, but instead of trying harder, he runs to God and now lives for him. He learned that only the law can convict him, but God can save him. See, Paul had now chosen to serve Christ, not the unrelenting, graceless law. He has a new master, full of grace. And in giving up on self-righteousness, giving up on trying to attempt all the things, all good things in his own strength, he died. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Paul's gone. He's, He's dead. He no longer lives. He's been born again by the Spirit of Christ. He is a new creation, one full of life by Christ's Spirit that now lives him in. It's totally new. Everything he does, he now does through trusting Christ. And all he does is out of gratitude and thankfulness and the strength that Christ's Spirit gives him. Because how can he do it any other way? And God has so graciously loved him and died for him. And now the law is silent to convict him. Is that how you go through life? In faith, in the spirit, walking in the new way, out of gratitude? Let's break that down. How do I live in faith? How do I live in a way that trusts Christ? Trust in Jesus. What's well, to live a life that is dependent on him. To live a life that says, I need your grace. Day in, day out. Totally dependent on it. It also means risky and costly living. Learning to be dependent on him. A good example of this might be evangelism. Where you literally do not have any of the power to achieve the outcome you hope to. You're completely dependent on God working through you to say the right things, to give you courage, to embolden you, and to work on this person's heart that you're loving and trying to lead through the truth of God's word and his gospel. To live in faith is to trust the words of God in Scripture day in, day out. To trust that he's got a plan for your life. To trust and to will that plan. To welcome it in your life. And walking in the Spirit in the new way. We must realize that there is still a battle between the old way and the new way. So we always pray that God would be at work in us through the Spirit of Christ in our life. We're to fill our mind with the Word of God so it might be transformed. Welcome this transformation in how we think and how we live. I love an example of what this looks like in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. There's a sense where to walk in the newness of life, you need to be reminded. And gratitude, to remember daily what Christ has done for you. And for some people, they do this differently. Some people start their day with a verse. I 
personally really love the saying that nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I claim. That realizes my utter, that helps me remember my utter dependence on Jesus. How thankful I am. To live a life, I mean, to start your day with gratitude is to demand nothing, but to be thankful for everything. To honor God with the life that he has saved. I want to end tonight with these words. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Paul is saying to Peter, don't nullify the grace of God. Remember who called you. And praise God, Peter recovered. Remembered who called him in his grace. To trust in our own works is to say, I don't need Jesus anymore. I can do it. There's no middle, there's no middle ground between that. Jesus says, you either trust in what I do, or you can trust in what you've done. The legalism or seeking to be right in our own efforts nullifies the grace of God on the cross. I don't need the cross. The law cannot justify sinners, not make them right before God, not make them innocent in the eyes of his law. It only tells us what is right and wrong. And that is bad news for people that are sinners by nature to only have the law because we need deliverance from the good law because we're not good. We need the grace of Almighty God. We need what Christ has won for us in his death, grace for our sins and his cloak of righteousness to cover us, presenting us as good before the Holy God. Paul knew, and we should too, how precious this grace is. How precious the blood of Jesus is that washes away sin. How the love of God has delivered us from judgment over to life with him. Oh, that we would love that cross. We would treasure that Christ. That's what this scripture is about. He's made us just and he's made us right. So let's love and praise him forever for the works he has done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we don't nullify your grace, Lord. We love it. We ask you to make it flow over us. We need your grace. We need your loving sacrifice of your son, both to remove us of our sin, but also to make us presentable before you by having his affection put on us. We thank you for these words of scripture that give us encouragement, remind us of what to hold on to in life. And there's all kinds of voices of accusation we traverse through this difficult life with you. So give us a sense of your grace in our lives and also give us the capacity to live out life having grace for others, not put on them burdens that they can't hold themselves. That we enter your family freely by what Jesus has done. So wait, may we remember that May we be thankful for that. May we receive that. In Jesus' name, amen.